Earlier in our course, we discussed sampling distributions. Particular distributions are associated with hypothesis testing. So perform tests of a population mean using a normal distribution or a student's t distribution. So remember that when we use the student's t distribution, we use it when the population standard deviation is unknown and the distribution of the sample mean is approximately normal. We perform tests of a population proportion using a normal distribution, and usually our sample size is large. So if you're testing a single proportion mean, the distribution for the test is for means, and you can see it here, and then the population parameter is mu, right? It's the mean, the estimated value, the point estimate for mu is x bar, which is the sample mean. So if you're testing a single population proportion, then this is the distribution that you'll use where the population parameter is P and the estimated value, uh, the point estimate for P is P prime. Next we have assumptions. So when you perform a hypothesis test of a single population mean mu using a student's T distribution, so we also call that a T test, there are fundamental assumptions that need to be met in order for the test to work properly. Okay, your data should be a simple random sample that comes from a population that is approximately normally distributed. We use the standard deviation to approximate the population standard deviation. And something that's important is you need to note that if the sample size is uh, large enough, then a t-test will work even if the population is not normally distributed. When you perform a hypothesis test of a single population mean, mu, using a normal distribution, we call this a z-test usually, you take a simple random sample from the population. The population you are testing is normally distributed. Your sample size is sufficiently large. You know the value of the population standard deviation, which in reality is rarely known. When you perform a hypothesis test of a single population proportion P, you take a simple random sample from the population. So you need to meet the conditions for a binomial distribution, which are there's a certain number of N of independent trials, the outcomes of any trial are a success or a failure, remember it's one or the other, and each trial has the same probability of a success P. The shape of the binomial distribution needs to be similar to a normal distribution. And to ensure this, the quantities NP and NQ must both be greater than 5. Then the binomial distribution of a sample proportion can be estimated uh, by the normal distribution where mu equals P and sigma equals the square root of PQ divided by N. Remember that Q is just 1 minus P. Next, we've got rare events, the sample decision, and conclusion. And then after I go over this, I am going to do a separate video of examples covering all of these things. And it, hopefully that will clarify what this is. So there are things called rare events. So suppose you make an assumption about a property of the population. The assumption is the null hypothesis. Then you gather some sample data randomly. If the sample has pro properties that would be very unlikely to occur if the assumption is true, then you conclude that your assumption about the population is probably incorrect. Remember that your assumption is just that. It's an assumption. It's not a fact. It may or may not be true, but your sample data are real, and the data are showing you a fact that seems to contradict your assumption. For example, Dee Dee and Ollie are at a birthday party of a very wealthy friend. They hurry to be first in line to grab a prize from a tall basket that they cannot see inside because they are blindfolded. There are 200 plastic bubbles in the basket, and Dee Dee and Allie have been told that there is only one with a $100 bill. Dee Dee is the first person to reach into the basket and pull out a bubble. Her bubble contains a $100 bill. The probability of this happening is 1200 is 0 0.005 because this is so unlikely Ali is hoping that what the two of them were told is wrong and there are more $100 bills in the basket so a rare event has occurred Dee Dee getting the $100 bills so Ali doubts 
the assumption about only one $100 bill being in the basket. We can also use a sample te to test the null hypothesis. So use the sample data to calculate the actual probability of getting the test result called the p-value. The p-value is the probability that, if the null hypothesis is true, the results from another randomly selected sample will be as extreme or more extreme as the results obtained from the given sample. So a large p-value calculated from the data indicates that we should not reject the null hypothesis. The smaller the p-value, then the more unlikely the outcome and the stronger the evidence is that against the null hypothesis. We would reject the null hypothesis if the evidence is strongly against it. And what you would do is you would draw a graph that shows the p-value, and then the hypothesis test is easier to perform if you use a graph because you see the problem more clearly. The last part is the decision and conclusion. So a systematic way to make a decision of whether to reject or not reject the null hypothesis is to compare the p-value to a preset or preconceived alpha the um, we would call it the significance level. So a preset alpha is the probability of a type 1 error. That's where we reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is actually true. And it may or may not be given to you at the beginning of the problem. When you make a decision to reject or not reject the null hypothesis, then you have to do the following steps. If alpha is greater than the p-value, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. The results of the sample data are significant. There is significant evidence to conclude that the null hypothesis is an incorrect belief and that the alternative hypothesis may be correct. If alpha is less than or equal to the p-value, then we don't reject the null hypothesis, which means that the results of the sample data are not significant. There is not sufficient evidence to conclude that the alternative hypothesis may be correct. When you do not reject the null hypothesis, it doesn't mean that you should believe that the null hypothesis is true. It simply means that the data have failed to provide sufficient evidence to cast serious doubt about the truthfulness of the null hypothesis. So then the conclusion is after you make your decision, you write a thoughtful conclusion about the hypotheses in terms of the given problem. Let's take a look at some examples to explain all of this information that I just shared with you.